Drown in fear and things of earth in vain to me are calling. None of these shall move me from Beulah land. I'm living on the mountain underneath the cloudless sky. I'm drinking at the fountain that never shall run dry. Oh yes, I'm feasting on the manna from a bountiful supply, for I am dwelling in Beulah land. I didn't say this to the folks in the first service, when we come to the chorus, you say, I'm living on the mountain underneath the cloudy sky, and then you can shout out, praise God. So you don't have to do that if you don't want to, <clears throat> but you are welcome to do that if you like. Let's sing that next verse. Let the stormy breezes blow, their cry cannot alarm me. I am safely sheltered here, protected by God's hand. Here the sun is always shining, here there's not can harm me. Am safe forever in Beulah land. I'm living on the mountain underneath the cloudless sky. I'm drinking at the fountain that never shall run dry. Oh yes, I'm feasting on the manna from a bountiful supply, for I am dwelling in Beulah land. Now, I, I asked you to do that, or at least whoever would like to do it, and I heard a bunch of you do it, but I didn't do it. So that's not fair, is it? So I'll, I'll join in with you and say praise God when we get there to that place. Viewing here the works of God, I sing in contemplation. Hearing now his blessed voice, I see the way he planned. Dwelling in the spirit here, I learn a full salvation. Gladly will I tarry in Beulah land. I'm living on the mountain underneath the cloudless sky. Praise God, I'm drinking at the fountain that never shall run dry. Oh yes, I'm feasting the manna from a bountiful supply, for I am dwelling in Beulah land. When you sing that song, it's an uplifting song, obviously, but you may say, well, that sure doesn't seem like Beulah land to me. It's it's not a physical place that he's talking about. Now, for the Jews, it was, there was a Beulah land. But for you and me, it's not heaven. It's what you make your life here. You know, the psalm, the psalm is said in Psalm 91, He that dwelleth in the secret place of the Most High shall abide under the shadow of the Almighty. And I ask you this morning, do you have a secret place? Are you abiding under the shadow of the Almighty? In other words, if you daily spend time alone with the Lord, if you daily are surrendering yourself to him, if you daily are making sure that sin is confessed and that you are, you are allowing the Holy Spirit to work in your life, then this is what you can have from day to day. You can have a Beulah land. doesn't mean there are not problems around you because there are many problems around. doesn't mean your health is always great because many folks bear sickness. But it can mean this. It can mean that you can have peace not only peace with God, you got that at salvation, but the peace of God reigning in your heart. You can have your own beautiful land. 
So a really good song, glad we opened up with that this morning. We're gonna look at our verse of the week, so if you'll join me there at your, in your bulletin or on the screen, 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 2. And we'll say the verse together, and let's begin. Unto the church of God, which is at Corinth, to them that are sanctified in Christ Jesus, called to be saints, with all that in every place call upon the name of Jesus Christ our Lord, both theirs and ours. I'm going to be beginning today, and including the next two Sundays or so, uh, preaching about the church. And I just want you to notice in this verse that he deals with an a individual local church, the church at Corinth. And the last statement deals with what some people refer to as the universal church, all that call upon the name of the Lord everywhere. It's a bunch of sanctified believers that God has made saints the day you got saved. And he puts you in a local assembly to fellowship and grow. But it includes all those believers who are in Afghanistan right now some who've already laid down their lives. I, I was just shocked to hear how many people have converted to Christianity in the 20 years since the United States has been involved in Afghanistan. And I know that everybody who calls themselves Christians is not necessarily born again, but surely there are a number of people who are born again believers. And I, I saw a message that came across. It was a message sent out from a church there in Afghanistan to someone on the outside who said, we can hear, we can hear the Taliban coming. Men and women and children, they said, we know what's about to happen. And then they said this, God's grace is great right now. God's grace is great in our hearts right now. And then the Taliban came in and gunned them all down, killed everybody. The church universal, many are suffering. We come in peace and comfort. But either way, it's a chance to gather together to keep each other encouraged, to help each other, and just to love the Lord Jesus Christ and serve him. So that's going to be our focus for the next few Sundays. Well, I'm going to encourage any men that would like to come and pray here at the altar to come at this time. As we go to prayer, uh, very sad to announce that Betty Jennings passed away this morning. I uh, did not find out till this week that she was actually brought back to this area and living in a nursing home for the last few months. And uh, Betty and her husband, Bob, served the Lord in a number of churches. He was a great preacher. Just recently, I uh, met a man. I was at a doctor, and I gave the doctor a track. And the doctor said, uh, I got saved years ago. And he told me the church. And I said, I bet I knew who the pastor was. Bob Jennings. He said, yep, that was my pastor. So he was a soul winner. He loved the Lord. Betty, great woman. And, you know, you hear Patty play. Well, Betty played. You remember Betty playing? She played for people like uh, Bob Jones Sr. and John R. Rice, and I think she played, well, she met anyway at a conference, the wife of Billy Sunday. She's just, she just a great lady, great, great woman of faith, and it was a kind of a spark plug here. But anyway, she's in heaven now, so she's far better off than we are. Praise the Lord for that, but pray for Isaac and Melody and their family in losing Betty this morning and uh, just pray for them. We'll try to let you know. We'll try to find out about calling hours and let you know about those things. And then if you would pray for my daughter, Katie. Uh, uh, she has had several miscarriages over the years. And uh, praise the Lord that the Lord has given them the one child, uh, Naomi, and she's special. She was not announcing this. In fact, she, she refuses to mention miscarriages uh, the reason I'm mentioning that is she's going to have surgery on Wednesday or Thursday at Mont General, and uh, I'm not going to go into all the details, but just the uh, inward workings that allow a woman to have a baby, they may end up uh, having to remove everything, which would guarantee her not having another child. So they're trying to do what they call the DNC, glad you're familiar with that without having to disturb that, but there are some complications there. So she texted me this morning, said, Dad, would you just, just tell them to pray for me? And so if you would pray for her, that maybe the Lord would make it to where that does not have to happen, and they can just help her with what needs to happen. It's gone for on for several weeks, and the body is not doing what it needs to do. So just pray for her if you would. And let's pray for the believers in Afghanistan. 
Let's pray for the Americans, 15,000 Americans behind enemy lines in Afghanistan. Pray for the troops in Afghanistan. Uh, you know all about it. Nothing needs to be said. They just need prayer. So let's, let's ask God to do a special work in these things. And let's ask God to do a work here that we bring glory to him today. So any of the men that would like to come, you come right ahead and uh, we'll go to the Lord in prayer. And Bill Gettle, if you wouldn't mind just coming up to the pulpit and leading everybody together and uh, we'll ask God to do a special work here today. Lord, we do thank you for the day and all your blessings. And as Pastor mentioned, uh, our troops uh, behind enemy lines and the other Americans that are in Afghanistan, the Christians, the, the pastors, the missionaries, those individuals, Lord, just give them comfort, watch over them, bring them home safely, Lord. Uh, it's, it's a challenging time for individuals overseas in those types of areas, Lord. Be with them. Be with uh, Katie. Watch over her. Thank you for her and Austin and their work at the church. Just give them comfort and, uh, and also be with the Jennings family. Uh, Bob and uh, Betty's who passed away and um, Bob also is in heaven, I'm assuming. Or be with them and as uh, they deal with the loss of Betty, Lord. Be with our pastor as he brings the message to the church family here. Watch over all them, and uh, Lord, we ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Uh, well, as the men are returning to their seats, we're going to sing again. We're going to sing uh, Glory to His Name, Down at the Cross Where My Savior Died. the cross where my Savior died, down where for cleansing from sin I cried, there to my heart was the blood applied, glory to his name, glory to his name. the blood applied. Glory to his name. I am so wondrously safe from sin. Jesus so sweetly abides within. There at the cross where he took me in. Glory to his name. Glory to his name. was the blood applied. Glory to his name. Oh, precious fountains, I am so glad I have entered in. There Jesus saves me and keeps me clean. Glory to his name. Glory to name. Glory to his name. There to my heart was the blood applied. Glory to his name. Come to this fountain so rich and sweet. Cast your poor soul at the Savior's feet. Plunge in today and be made complete. Glory to his name. Glory to his name. Glory to his name. There to my heart was the blood applied. Glory to his name. And you may be seated. We're going to start off today with uh, the announcer who is pretty, followed by Paul. So. Uh, 
I am also the favorite daughter-in-law, just so everybody knows. It's on record and now on the internet, so I vote yes. Okay, so the fall, uh, the fall market is gonna be on September 18th, so if you have stuff that you would like to donate for the yard sale, we still we have a bunch of stuff over there, and I actually was talking to my mother-in-law, and she said we've already made like 50 bucks, and in my world, that's like a really good yard sale. <laughs> I'm like, yay! So if you wanna donate some stuff like that, there's a table over there that's already marked that says um, donations here. You don't have to organize them, you don't have to do anything, you just set them on the table, and me and Debbie will take care of it. Um, applications for the craft show are back here on the little corner table. So just fill that out, it's $25 for a 10 by 10. If you have questions or something like that, you can see me or Debbie. Um, also baked goods, we're looking for donations there. So um, if you wanna bake, but you don't wanna sell anything, <laughs> you know, just see us and we can help you out. Uh, and then there's also just like when you need to have it in and things like that. We're also looking just for volunteers for general stuff. Um, I've been bugging some people about parking. So if you wanna help us like, I in my plan of events, it is gonna be so, chaotic because there will be so many people here that we are going to need parking attendants and that is the hope and the dream right now <laughs> so if you want to help with that kind of stuff or organizing or pricing or anything like that um let me know in or debbie and we can get with you on that and i think i feel like i'm missing something if i am huh we need hangers and bags thank you we need hangers and bags we need lots of hangers we need lots of bags so if you don't have anything like let's say you're like super neat and you want to just not get rid of stuff but you have hangers and bags that you want to give us that would be awesome and then there was one more thing but I also don't remember that and so if I'll remember next week what I forgot to say <laughs> but yeah if, also if you have any questions just contact me and we can make it happen all right oh there he is the non-ugly man <laughs> thank you Raylene if you're happy to be here let's get that hand up in the air after the person beside you, behind you, in front of you is here, the other hand is up in the air. And while we have our hands in the air, all God's people say, praise the Lord. We have uh, several announcements. And if anyone says there's nothing to do, I don't want to hear it. Because you could plug yourself in. Every day this week, there's something to do. Uh, this evening, of course, at 5 o'clock, we have our Bible study hour. We meet up here, divide into groups. Now, tomorrow and Tuesday, there is a prophecy conference at Lighthouse Baptist Church in Salem, West Virginia. It's at 7 o'clock. That's Monday and Tuesday. Of course, Wednesday, we meet back here for our midweek service with something for everyone. That's at 7 o'clock. Thursday evening at 6.30, we have the church-wide visitation. We meet here at the church and go out into our communities. Now, Friday and Saturday... We have people going to the Ark Encounter. We also have an Iron Man conference at Bible Baptist Temple. It starts on Friday at 7 o'clock and then resumes again on Saturday at 9 o'clock. It's always a good time. There is a sign-up sheet downstairs in the foyer if you're able to go and which dates because they have to plan because when we go to Iron Man conferences, we eat. So they plan for everything. So that's a, a great time. Now, August the 29th, that is a Sunday. That's next Sunday. We have our church business meeting. Again, September the 4th, that's going to be on a Saturday. We have the men's prayer meeting here at the church at 9 o'clock in the morning. Also, Awana begins on September the 8th. That's the second Wednesday in September. Starts at 6.45, starts 15 minutes early. They meet up here in the auditorium. If you're able to help out in any way, and there's many ways to help out, even by donating money or pop or chips or snacks, see Brother Chris Vaughn on that. So if you're interested in helping. Now, September 11th for you ladies, Ariel Wynn's baby shower is going to be here at the church at 2 o'clock. So we have a lot of things that are packed in here recently. The last thing that I have, I dusted off a top 10 list from the archive of forgotten announcements. So in the Bible, 1 Corinthians 13, 11 says, when I was a child, I spake as a child. I understood as a child. I thought as a child. But when I became a man, I put away childish things. So what if we never stop thinking of a child? How would things change? Here it is, the top 10 list. During communion, everyone would try to get the biggest piece of unleavened bread and the fullest cup of grape juice. 
then immediately asked for seconds. Business meetings would result in whining and crying and calling each other names. The choir would sing Father Abraham every Sunday morning and use all the body motions. All covered dish dinners would consist of cupcakes and cookies. We wouldn't need restrooms because we'd all be wearing diapers, which gives the phrase sitting in a pew a whole new meaning. Because we don't need restrooms, the ushers would pass out flavored lifesavers when they took up the offering. We would stop halfway through pastor's sermons to have a snack. Deacon and trustee meetings would include ice cream and party hats. The baptismal would be equipped with a water slide. And lastly, Grace Baptist Church would have the best Bible schools ever. Thank you very much. That was very good. <laughs> and that leads us right into our next song. <laughs> you guys want to sing Father Abraham? <laughs> Father Abraham had many sons. We had to do it at Good News Club every, every week. So, hey, if I can lose my dignity in Good News Club, I guess I can lose it on live stream too. So anyway, all right, well, let's, let's stand once again. We're going to sing, Jesus, keep me near the cross. Jesus, keep me near the cross. There a precious fountain free. seated. We'll go ahead and take our Bibles and go to Ephesians chapter 5 while you're turning there. Uh, Paul already mentioned about next Sunday evening's 
uh, church business meeting. It's just a regular business meeting. We're required to do it every quarter. So here outside the main office in the holder are the financial statements. I encourage you, if you're a member, to take one and look over it in preparation for next week. Now, it is just a regular business meeting. There's no, there's not a lot of new business. But I think what I will do next Sunday afternoon, of course, that will follow the Bible study hour at 5, and we'll meet back here in the auditorium at 6. What I think I'll do is I will just uh, also entertain any questions or comments that you have about our guest last week, Brother Alunas. So I thought, well, we'll just take opportunity to do that. Now, when I spoke to Brother Alunas, I just told him uh, on his end uh, to take about a month to pray and decide if this is where God may want him and that at that time he can let me know whether he wants to be considered as a candidate for our youth pastorate or not. And so I'm giving him to about the middle of September. Uh, he's back in Lancaster now. And I, I'll tell you this, uh, he texted me a few days ago and said, would you send me the list of all the names of the teens? He said, I want to begin to pray for them. And that made an impression on me. And I, I hope that makes an impression on you too. He, he may or may not end up here, but he'll still be in prayer for the teens that are involved in our teen ministry. So that was pretty impressive to me. So on our end, uh, we will not uh, consider that next week, but if Brother Alunas does say he is interested, then we'll present that to the church family sometime mid to late September, and we will uh, vote on that as to uh, Brother Alunas. So just keep that in mind. So if you would, keep that in mind. And then I um, heard some good news today. I texted Ethan Walker, and I guess... Uh, his dad, Mick, is doing better and out of intensive care with COVID. So we praise the Lord for that. Uh, Denver Burnside, pastor down at Crimson River, and his wife both have COVID, but he told me they're both doing better, so we're grateful for that. I told you about Ephraim Garcia, who was my song leader and one of my deacons at the little church I pastored before coming here there in Atlanta, and he is not doing well. Uh, he is doing very, very poorly. And... Um, Things took a turn for the worse yesterday, and we have not been able to get in contact with the family. So if you would, if you think about that name, Ephraim Garcia, you'd pray for him and his family. He actually is now in the church where my daughter Chelsea is a member, a New Beginning Baptist. So really appreciate you praying for them. All right. Let's have a word of prayer, and we'll get right into the message this morning. Father, I thank you for the the privilege of being able to preach your word. And I ask, Lord, that you would use me. I ask that you would allow your Holy Spirit to speak through me. I realize and I understand this, that my words mean absolutely nothing. Your word means everything. I know you use a vessel, and I'm the vessel. So I ask that you would use me as you see fit. Lord, we ask that you be glorified today. Lord, I pray that I would be receptive to what you have given me, and each of us would be receptive to your word. <clears throat> and Lord, we'll thank you for it. I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Excuse me for a minute. I'm going to begin to read here in Ephesians chapter 5. I'm going to begin to read in verse 25. Husbands, love your wives. Now, I'm going to mention this. I'm going to take the pronoun it, and I'm going to change it to the noun church. As we go through this passage, husbands, love your wives, even as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for the church, that he might sanctify and cleanse the church with the washing of water by the word, that he might present the church to himself a glorious church, not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that the church should be holy and without blemish. So ought men to love their wives as their own bodies. He that loveth his wife loveth himself. For no man ever yet hated his own flesh, but nourisheth and cherisheth his body, even as the Lord the church. Now, <clears throat> this morning I'm not speaking about marriage. Uh, we've done that quite a bit over the years. We've had some very special sessions uh, in the time I've been here as pastor. Uh, we've on a marriage retreat. We've brought others in to focus on marriage, but that's not what I'm talking about today. 
That's not where the focus is. I'm preaching today and will do so the next few Sundays on the church. I want you to think for a moment with me. Just like in a marriage that is excellent. Just like in a marriage that is excellent. A man cherishes his wife and that's why it's excellent. And hopefully the wife, the husband. But we're told that Christ cherishes his bride, the church. He cherishes it. So the title of this mini-series, I guess you call it, <clears throat> is Cherish the Church. Cherish the Church. Um, when I was younger in ministry, <clears throat> I would get asked once in a while to sing at a wedding. And so uh, I always enjoyed it. I, I really enjoy doing weddings. I have a wedding coming up here in the month of September. I, I enjoy doing those, officiating those. And I like singing at them. So. Uh, there was a song that I heard, and I was asked to sing it. I had never heard it before, and I was like, boy, this is great. And I think it now is my favorite wedding song. It's by an artist called Steve Green. How many have ever heard of Steve Green? Okay, a good number of you have. And he wrote a song called Cherish the Treasure. And the first verse goes like this. I cherish the treasure, the treasure of you. Life's long companion, I give myself to you. God has enabled me to walk with you faithfully and cherish the treasure, the treasure of you. Now that was the special as part of the message today. But anyway, I did that for a reason. Because when I give you the definition, I don't think the definition can quite make the impact as the meaning behind that song. Uh, it's, it's normally done with a man and a woman uh, representing the husband and wife and they're singing back and forth to each other and then they join in together. And really, really beautiful words and a beautiful melody as well. And I think it, it kind of helps express what cherishing someone means. Now here's the biblical definition of the word cherish. It means to heat to soften by heat. You say, what? That doesn't, that doesn't register. Well, I think just that first part of the definition means this. People get hard toward each other. And sometimes even in marriage, a husband and wife get hard toward each other. And they become unbending. It's my way or it's no way. Or you've hurt me so many times, I'm just not willing to open myself up to you anymore. That kind of thing. When you cherish someone's, it kind of heats up, you would, the relationship that can happen between a, a parent and a child. It's happened between church members. And cherishing someone begins to heat that up and to soften the other individual. In the definition, it goes on to say, it's to keep warm as birds covering their young with their feathers. And I can't help but think about the picture that Jesus gave as he's there at Jerusalem, oh, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, thou that slayest the prophets. And he goes on to say, how often would I have gathered thee together as a chicken gather her, her uh, chickens under her wings. And you, you see that picture of the mother hen gathering her chicks, protecting them and cherishing them. And it finishes the definition this way, to cherish with tender love to foster with tender care. I think between those two things, that song and that definition, you get it. Maybe you didn't even need a definition. But this is what I want you to understand. Jesus Christ cherishes the church. He cherishes the church. Now there's another song. It's a hymn that we on occasions have sung here. I'm not gonna sing this one. But the words say this, I have one deep supreme desire that I may be like Jesus. To this I earnestly aspire that I may be like Jesus. Christian, listen to me. You and I ought to be like Jesus. Now listen, and cherish the church. We ought to cherish the church. There's a reason God compared Jesus' love for the church 
to a man's love for his wife. Because we get the imagery, especially if you're married, you get it. And if you happen to have a good marriage, it deepens the meaning even more. And there's a reason why such a huge emphasis is placed on the church in the New Testament. And it's overwhelming. Church. It doesn't mean the same thing to every believer. I believe to have a proper understanding, a proper acknowledgement of the church, you and I have to see the church as Jesus sees the church. Otherwise, it's deficient and incorrect. We're told here in Ephesians 29 that Christ nourishes and cherishes the church. Nourishes and cherishes the church. Notice the order. It begins by nourishing the church. What does the word nourish mean? It means to raise up or rear someone up to maturity. In the next chapter, Ephesians chapter 6, verse 4, notice what it says. Ye fathers, provoke not your children to wrath, but bring them up in the nurture an admonition of the Lord. What does the word nurture mean? It means that which nourishes and promotes growth. Now picture this. Let's get some mental images going here. You're going to nurture a child. And this especially is true with the mom in these early months. That little infant that you have carried in your womb for nine months now is placed in your arm at that very moment, and every mom understands what I'm saying, you begin to nurture your child. You look at that little child and you say something like, hello, I love you. At that moment, as that child hears that voice, you begin the process of nurturing. You hold that little infant close to your body and that little infant begins to drink of the milk of your own body and you begin to nourish that child so it'll do what? So it'll grow. <clears throat> you begin to nurture that child and over the months you begin to speak to it. In fact, you probably speak to it constantly and you know, as the child begins to put some months upon it, you think, well, one day she'll or he'll be able to begin to say little words. And so you go, mama, say mama. Then you mouth the words or dada, say dada. And you know what? You know why you're doing that? Because you want them to acknowledge you. And you're teaching them to talk. And the first time that little infant goes, mama, you go, oh, yay. And you just reinforce with a positive reinforcement nurturing. And then dad, about six months, you watch that child begin to make efforts to crawl. And you say, come on, son, you can do it. Come on, good boy, good boy, don't you? I mean, if you haven't, I have. I mean, I did that with my kids, that kind of thing. And then you reach down and you take those two fingers and you just take that little hand here, and that little hand here, and you lift them up and they're unsteady, and then you try to make them take a step. Now, their way too young yet, but you are beginning to nurture, teaching them how to take a step. And then about eight months, they go over to the couch and they, they grab their hands and they are unsteady, but they pull themselves up and they stand at the couch and they turn and look at you like, and you go, oh, good, good boy, good girl. And you are nurturing them. First time they take a step, man, it is celebratory and you get your phone out and you start filming it or you start taking pictures because you want everybody to see my, my, my child just took a step. I, I said to the folks earlier today uh, with our kids, we would drive down the road somewhere and we would use it as a teaching time so we start doing phonics with them. And some of our kids began to read at three years of age just because we were nurturing them. We were bringing them to maturity. <clears throat> Here's a reality. If you are still in your parents' home, young person, it's your parents' responsibility to nurture you until the day you walk out that door for the last time. And don't be foolish to reject the nurturing of your parents. For my son, Corey, was 17. That's when he left. For my daughter, Chelsea, I think she was 21 when she left. 
So it doesn't matter how short you are there or how long you're in your parents' home, your parents' responsibility is to nurture you, to help mature you. And believe me, you don't know everything you think you know. And you'd be a smart man or a smart woman to listen. And you ought to take my advice. You nurture them. And here's the Lord Jesus. What does he do? He says he nourishes the church. His purpose is to grow us and to mature us. But you know what? If you've served in the military and you had a drill instructor, that drill instructor may have loved you. He may stand there at graduation day and say, mm, good job, Marine, or good job, soldier, or whatever it may be, and there is, there is like, proud of you. There's an attitude of, of, of love. But from the day you enter basic training until the day you graduate, you don't feel his love. Now, I'm not going to use some of the words that a drill instructor uses with some of his people. Now, I had a nephew in the Marine Corps, and he had a, a drill instructor that refused to allow cursing. And I thought, that's, that's unusual. But, you know, a lot of the things they say aren't things you repeat in the pulpit of a church. You may not have felt loved, but maybe he loved you. He said, what are you, what are you saying? What I'm saying is this. Even though this is not a message on marriage or message on parenting, you as a mom and dad, you, you are responsible to nurture your children until the day they walk out your doors, but you need to do it through cherishing them. I've watched kids who have drill instructors for parents who don't acknowledge and reinforce their love for their children, and this is what happens to those children when they get the chance. They're gone and they rebel. And they want nothing to do with their parents. Oh yeah, they had them in church every Sunday, and oh yes, they towed the line, and oh yes, they were good independent fundamental Baptists. Yes, they were that, and then when they got an opportunity, gone they were because they were nourished, but they weren't cherished. So we as parents need to make sure that we not only nourish, rear up our children to help them to maturity physically, mentally, emotionally, and especially spiritually, we need to, to, we need to cherish our children. And if you're a husband or a wife, you need to help nurture your mate, to help them be everything they ought to be, but not void of cherishing them. And here's the Lord Jesus. He nurtures his bride and he cherishes his bride. Well, let's be honest. <clears throat> to some believers, church is their life. Church is their life. And for me, church has been my life. Now, to a lot of people, I, I'm, I'm fearful that even in the church, to make that kind of statement sounds weird. He's some kind of a religious kook. Uh, I think that's normal. And when church is not somebody's life, I think that's abnormal. You know, you know my background. I've told you many times. I, I, I don't really have any shame in doing that. I, I grew up in two churches in my childhood, Canton Gospel Center up till the age of 11, and then from 11 until into my adulthood, the Camp Baptist Temple. And I love both churches. They're both gospel preaching churches. And I had people there that loved me. They did exactly what the scripture says. They nourished and cherished me. That was important for me because of the problems that were in my home life. Now, I have great relationship with all my siblings, and we were close growing up. Uh, and I love both my parents. They're both now in heaven, both saved, but they struggled in their marriage. So there came a point in my life where, for me, there was an absence of parenting. One was gone from my life for long periods of time. The other one was there, but had so many heartaches, they never were able to focus on their responsibility like they should have. So there was this absence of nourishing and cherishing in my home. So when I went to the Gospel Center, Mrs. Geiger nourished me and cherished me. Dr. Harlan O'Dell, my pastor, he was an important man. We had a portrait of him with Chiang Kai-shek, the Prime Minister of Taiwan. He was an important man. 
but he took time for a little boy. And he loved me. Later on, we go to the Camp Baptist Temple, and there was Sandy Vaught and Charles Schuster and Bill Eakin and Bud Redman and Gene Brown. When I went to my brother-in-law's funeral a month ago, I saw one of those men, Bill Eakin. He said, Jeff, oh, it's so good to see you. How is your church doing? And I said, we're doing pretty good. He said, I, I want to come down and see your church. Now, Brother Eakin's an old man now, and I don't know if he'll ever make it down here. But I do, I do know this, he's never stopped cherishing me. For me, life, church is my life. You say, that's because you're a pastor and you live right there. No, 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 you don't, you don't understand. Church has always been my life. This is my life. It was my life when I was a child. It was a, my life when I was a teenager. And when I, my dad's second marriage, went very poorly, and at 18, I walk into the room where my dad is sitting, I said, I'm leaving. I said, I, I, can't, I can't deal with this a second time, so I'm leaving. And you know what, as an 18-year-old boy, I didn't go into the world and go crazy. You know what I did? I stayed in church, and they ministered to me and loved me and helped me during those times, where it had been very easy for me to go into the world and rebel I had so much love in that church, I stayed. In fact, my siblings did too. Church is my life. And I think it is for some of you too. To others, to other Christians, church is just a part of their life. It's just a compartment. And I know we all have to work. And I don't expect anybody not to take advantage of the things that can, as we like to say, socially develop our children. So, you know, even for me, I grew up in public school all 12 years. I played football. I was in choir. I was in band. I, you know, I did those things. But my life was the church, not sports, not the public school not Christian school, not private school, not my work, not my family. Church. I want you to understand that Jesus cherishes the church. Now let's define church. Let's define church. The first mention of church is found in Matthew chapter 16 verse 18. A lot of you can quote this. I'm just going to quote the last part. Jesus is speaking to Peter and he says, and upon this rock I will build my church and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. And you know what? That has turned out to be true. 2,000 years the church has stood. If you were to go to Nigeria today, you would find a group of about 80 boys in a Baptist school who were kidnapped by terrorists to either force them to become terrorists and become Islamic. Mentioned, I think, earlier about the church there in Afghanistan, knowing the Taliban was coming down the streets, knowing they were going to enter in, knowing what they were going to face, they were all slaughtered. And you can go back through the history of the church around the world and the church has stood the church has stood it hasn't collapsed the gates of hell have never been able to prevail against the church yes praise the Lord for that the idea of the church and I want this to be understood the idea of the church as we often think about church was not a man-made invention as some people try to insinuate. You don't need church. You don't need to organize religion. The word church has the following meaning. 
And I'll, I'll just use the, the Greek word because it's going to be included here when I read these definitions. You've heard many preachers or teachers, whoever, use the word ekklesia, that Greek word. I'm going to give you two definitions. The first one is, is from Vine's Expository Bible Dictionary. It says this, the word ekklesia was used by the Greeks to describe a body or group of citizens gathered to discuss the affairs of state. So this is something that Greek people understood because, you know, what the word is, it's Greek. But anyway, the definition goes on and says in the Septuagint, of course, you know that's the Hebrew Old Testament that was translated into Greek. The Septuagint, in the Septuagint, it is used to designate the gathering of Israel summoned for any purpose. And you'll hear the term on the Sabbath day that they had a holy convocation. What is that? They gathered together. They gathered together. In Strong's Greek Dictionary, the word ekklesia is described this way, a calling out, that is, a popular meeting, especially a religious gathering. So the word church means a religious gathering, a called out people, called out from sin, called out from the world, that meet together. That's what the word church means. So this goes contrary to those who say, I don't need the church to worship God. Now, in part, that's true. So, no, you, you don't need a church to necessarily worship God. That's why I say tomorrow morning or tomorrow evening or at some time, you need to just step aside and worship God. And then on Tuesday, you need to spend some time individually worshiping God. And then before you come back for Wednesday night service, you need to spend some time worshiping God. And then on Thursday, and then on Friday and Saturday, and then we come back together as an assembly, the called out assembly, the ecclesia, the church, and we worship God together. So no, you, you don't need church to worship God, but you do, listen to me carefully, you do need church to be an obedient Christian. You do need church to be an obedient Christian. This also goes contrary to those who say, I am the church. No, you are not the church. You are part of the church. You are part of the church. You yourself are not the church. You cannot prove that scripturally. In fact, the scripture will prove you wrong. In 1 Corinthians, I believe it's chapter 12, he talks about the body, and that's what the church is referred to, the body of Christ. And he says that we are individual members. You might be an ear, a finger, a toe, a kidney for all that's worth. He said there are different parts of the body, and the body comes, the different parts of the body come together and they make up the whole, that make up the whole body. You are not the body. You are part of the body. Some would argue that the church isn't brick and mortar. Well, that's true. You know, we can all acknowledge that. People make up the church. So it really doesn't have much meaning if you have a church and you don't have people within the walls. Now, there are churches that are empty. I just got a call this week from a church that's about ready to close. Doesn't do any good to have a steeple and have pews and have a name sign out front, but nobody in the church. People make up the church. People make up the body of Christ. Let me... Let me direct another comment about a fallacy. Our bodies are not called the church. Our bodies personally are called the temple. First Corinthians chapter six, verse 19. What know ye not that your body, your body, your individual body is the temple of the Holy Ghost. Your body is not the church. All these bodies together make up the church. It, it can be just two or three 
or it can be 2,000 or 3,000 or 20,000 or 30,000, but it's corporately together that makes up the body of Christ. Now I want you to notice, go with me to Colossians chapter 1. Colossians chapter 1. I want you to notice something. This is very important. I want you to notice Colossians chapter 1, look at verse 14. Of course, this is talking about Jesus Christ. It says, in whom or in Jesus Christ we have redemption through his blood, even the forgiveness of sins, who is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of every creature. For by him were all things created that are in heaven and that are in earth, visible and invisible, whether they be thrones or dominions or principalities or powers, all things were created by him and for him. And he is before all things and by him all things consist. And he is the head, now notice this, he is the head of the body, the church. So there the church, the called out assembly, is called the body. Individually, you're the temple. Corporately, we're the body of Christ. Again, uh, there in verse 18, he is the head of the body, the church who is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, that in all things he might have the preeminence. So in the body, Jesus Christ is to have the preeminence, not Pastor Vaughn, not the deacons, not some church member that gets on their high horse and wants to control. And I, I can tell you about some churches like that where some individual member tries to take over and control no, sir, neither pastor nor elders control Jesus Christ is preeminent. That's why we've got to focus on this book, not on a personality or a man. But there's another thing I want you to notice here. You go back to verse 15, it says that Jesus is the image of the invisible God. Now, here's what the Bible clearly tells us. No man hath seen God at any time. No man. No man has seen Jehovah God. We could not endure it. This flesh could not endure that. No man has seen God at any time. So, hear me, Jesus is the image of that invisible God. Jesus is the image of Jehovah He's the image of his father. We're told, and we beheld his glory, the glory as of the only begotten of the father, full of grace and truth. He took on flesh and dwelt among us. He humbled himself and took on flesh. And became obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. What, what happened? Jesus is the image of the God you have never seen. And no man had ever seen until Jesus, Emmanuel, came to earth. And what does Emmanuel mean? Tell me. God with us. So God comes to earth. John said in 1 John 5, 20, he is the true God and eternal life. Paul said in the book of Titus, he is the great God and our Savior, Jesus Christ. We're told in the book of Colossians, in him, in Jesus, dwells all the fullness of the Godhead bodily. That phrase means he is absolute perfect God. He is God in the flesh, Emmanuel. Not inferior, not small, he is God come in the flesh. Philip, in the upper room, before they go to the Garden of Gethsemane, says, Jesus, show us the Father, and we'll be satisfied. Jesus said, Philip, if you have seen me, you have seen the Father. Jesus is the image of the invisible God. Now listen, and the church is the image of Jesus Christ. On the day he ascended back to heaven, 40 days after his resurrection, he has never since stepped foot on the earth. For the last 2,000 plus years, no man has ever seen physically Jesus Christ. 
No one. So in a sense, he's now invisible too. So God, as he's presented here in Colossians as the invisible God, said, I'll solve that, I'll send my son. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. And people saw God in Jesus. Well, since Jesus is in heaven for the, 2000, the last 2,000 years, how does the lost see Jesus? The church. When you go to work and when you go out to eat after the service, if you do that, and when you go to school, people will see Jesus in you and he's either going to look really good or he's going to look foolish. He's going to look like a liar. He's going to look cheap. All dependent on your image that people see of you in your daily life and in my daily life, at the workplace, in the home, in the neighborhood. How many of you have ever heard the term the invisible church? How many of you have ever heard the term? Okay. Now, there's a... Uh, parallel term that I, I, I can't say I reject it, but I, I understand why some you know, don't even like to acknowledge this term. There, it's called the invisible church or uh, it's called, excuse me, the universal church. Now we know that Roman Catholicism, even from the early centuries, uh, the term Catholic means universal. So they refer to themselves as the universal church. Uh, so we like to kind of stay away from that term. So the, the term invisible church, you're not going to find either term in scripture, but we understand what they mean. Now, here's my point. I believe in the individual or the invisible church. I believe in the universal church. I'm not talking about Roman Catholicism. I'm talking about the fact that across this planet, there's church. There are believers. There, there are believers in Afghanistan fighting for their lives today or having to do what the book of Revelation said, be thou faithful unto death, and I will give thee the crown of life. There are Christians in Ecuador. There are Christians in Guam. There are Christians in Newfoundland, Canada. I mean, there's Christians all over the place. Uh, they have buildings that they meet in, and they have pastors and elders or deacons. But I'm not there. I'm not in Guam this morning. I have no idea what some local assembly in Guam is doing. I have no idea what their pastor is preaching. I'm not there to hear it. I'm not there to sit in their business meetings to make decisions. But I recognize that there are churches all over the place. Local assemblies have called out believers who are gathering together as we meet here. I mean, right across town we got that. So I don't think you can just, well, I don't, I don't believe in a universal church. Well. I don't believe in it as it's used sometimes in theological terms today, but I acknowledge there's an invisible church or a universal church. In fact, the Bible recognizes that. Go with me in your Bibles to the book of Hebrews and look at chapter 12. Hebrews chapter 12. And this is really interesting to me. It's been interesting to me for a long time. Hebrews chapter 12, when you begin to read with me in verse 22. In Hebrews 12, 22, it says, But ye are come unto Mount Zion, and unto the city of the living God, the heavenly Jerusalem, and to an innumerable company of angels, to the general assembly and church of the firstborn. Notice that term, the general assembly and church. In other words, all believers throughout the New Testament era who've been part of the church, the called out, called out from sin, called out from the world, called to Jesus Christ, blood-bought, blood-washed, born-again, sanctified people like we just read earlier today about in 1 Corinthians chapter 1 and verse 2. The general assembly and church of the firstborn. But notice it goes on, it says, which are in heaven. You realize, and just this, this thought came to me this morning, there are more Christians in heaven than there are on earth. 
2,000 years worth of people getting saved, there are millions and millions and millions and millions and millions and millions of people who over the last 2,000 years have been born again who are now in heaven. We're the minority. They are the majority. And praise God, we get to join them. Amen? That's a good thing. And he goes on to say, and to God the judge of all. He's there. And to the spirits of just men made perfect. And I kind of think, I could be wrong on this, so this is just opinion. I think that might indicate Old Testament saints. They weren't part of the church, but they were justified. Verse 24, and to Jesus, the mediator of the new covenant, and to the blood of sprinkling that speaketh better things than of Abel. So there's an acknowledgement in this passage about believers, really of every generation. Those who are in heaven, those who are on earth, so forth. All part of the family. A universal or an invisible church. So what does that mean for you and me? It almost means absolutely nothing because, again, I can't, I can't fellowship with the people in Guam or even in Newfoundland and Canada, even though I can drive there. It may take me a while, but I, you know, I, if I'd have left this morning at, now nah, I couldn't have gone there anyway. So, you know, it doesn't do me any good, and it doesn't do you any good, other than the acknowledgement that it exists. So what did Jesus do? He gave us the local church. And that is the major emphasis of the New Testament. The emphasis is the local church or the visible church. Now, I'm not going to go through a lot of verses, but if you're interested, if you, you know, on the back of your bulletin has a place, I still think it has a place where you can take notes, I'd write these things down. There were churches that just met in houses because they didn't have buildings yet. Praise God for a building to meet in. Otherwise, we'd all have to meet at D. Watson's house, and I don't think we could all fit. You, you would allow us to come, right? Sure would. Okay. All right, so Romans chapter 16, verses 3, and 5, 3 through 5, talks about the church that was in Aquila and Priscilla's house. And then Colossians chapter 4, verse 15. I'll just read it to you. Salute the brethren which are in Laodicea, and Nymphus, as an individual, and Nymphus and the church which is in his house. So in Nymphus' house they had a church. And then Philemon chapter 1 verse 2 talks about the church that was in Philemon's house. Now why did they have house church? Not for the reason that people have house church today, and I am totally against house church. They met in houses because they didn't have buildings. In fact, Grace Baptist Church started out in the house. We had two couples, the Posies and the Whitehairs. And those two couples met and said, we want an independent fundamental Baptist church in our area because we don't have any. And so they met, it wasn't Pastor Nisley yet, I can't remember the gentleman's name, and they began to meet in houses. Pastor Barnes. Pastor Barnes, Pastor Barnes and the Whitehairs and the Posies, and they would meet in a house. And they eventually brought Pastor Nisley down, and they met in a house. That's where Grace Baptist Church started, in a house. And then we had a single wide trader out here, and this is all swampy area. And then they eventually built a little block building so they could have teams in it. And then they built a modular structure. This is the first level of, this, of the wing, is a modular building that used to be the church. And then they built the basement. And then they put that modular building on top of the wing. And then they built this. And then we built that. And the next thing we're going to build is, oh, I'm just teasing. Started in a, in a house, a group of called out believers. And when you go through the New Testament, all you see is emphasis on not the universal or invisible church, but on the local church. You say, how so? Go to Revelation chapter 1. Go to Revelation chapter 1. Look at verse 4. Revelation chapter 1, verse 4. Now participate with me. I'm going to come to a word. I'm going to pause and I'm going to have you say the next word. John to the what? 
John to the seven churches, not to the church. John to the seven churches. And then when you go into chapter 2 and chapter 3 of Revelation, there's a personal message, a personal challenge, and personal blessings for every individual church. What were those churches? The church at Ephesus, the church at Smyrna, the church at Pergamos, the church at Thyatira, the church at Sardis, the church at Philadelphia, no, not in Pennsylvania, but over in the Middle East, and the church at Laodicea. Individual, local uh, fellowships or local churches. You also can go to Galatians chapter one and verse two. You don't have to turn there, but it talks about the churches, plural, in Galatia. And those churches included Iconium, the church at Lystra, the church at Derbe, the church at Antioch. You can go to 2 Corinthians chapter 8, verse 1, and it talks about the churches, plural, at Macedonia. And they included, not necessarily limited to, but included Philippi, Thessalonica, and Berea. What am I saying? The emphasis in the New Testament isn't you just, you know, being the church yourself, because that's a fallacy that's not true. You can't be the church. It has to be a group of people. Together, collectively, we make up the body of Christ. Now, you may be an ear. Uh, you may be the nose. I, I don't know what you are, and you don't know what I am, but, but I do know this. Individually, I'm not the church, nor are you, but together we make up the church. We make up the body of Christ. And we gather together. It talks about, in Galatians 1-2, the churches of Galatia. In Romans chapter 16, verse 1, the church at Centria. 1 Corinthians 1, 2, the church at Corinth. And on and on it goes. Individual, local assemblies where they had their own pastors, their own elders, their own deacons, and they had a bunch of responsibilities. You say, Pastor, I, I know a lot of this. And I know you do. You say, why are you preaching this? Why are you going to teach this for the next few Sundays? Because I've seen what's happened to the Church of Christ around the world. What a thing called a pandemic has done to the church. We have been, we have been kind of blessed in this sense that what we were running previous to the pandemic, you combine our two services together, and we're getting near what we had before. Now, we've had people quit. Some families said, we're never coming back. We've had others that have told me, we will not come while there's ever a pandemic. We're not coming. And when it's done someday, unfortunately, and here's a problem, they say now, and, and this is not, you know, QAnon. This is not even Newsmax, you know, that offends some people. This is just, you know, this is CNN, this is NBC, this is NBC, ABC. You know, the New York Times, they said the variants are not going to stop. They just, well, they just keep mutating and we'll keep having this, and it's never going to end. That is what they're preparing us for. That, that's not conspiracy. That's what the scientists are telling us. It's just one of those things It's not going to stop. Church in Florida running 550 people. I mean, not membership. I mean, attending now down to about 300 and some. That's a huge hit. There are churches all across this nation that many people have said, we're never coming back. I'm grateful you're here. But I want to make sure that we have the right mind about what the church really is. And the fact that it was so important to Jesus that he cherishes it. And that we ought to have the mind of Christ and we ought to cherish it too. Not just let it be a part of our life. In fact, the Bible says, the New Testament says, Christ died for the, what? Church. Now, we understand, technically, theologically, what that means. It means he died for the people who come, the called out assembly, who have put their trust in Christ. Individuals who have come together. He, he died. Yes, I understand. He didn't die for brick and mortar. I get that. You get that. But I won't lie to you. I'm concerned about the state of mind of believers about church. And I, and I say that because my state of mind, you know, we start with this pandemic and I made the decision, you know, we're not going to physically meet together. And a lot of churches, if not most churches, 
did the same thing, and many places they were forced to do that. And so, you know, I'm trying to preach to a little phone, and people are calling and said, I can't understand a word you're saying, and it's all blurry, it doesn't make any sense. And then a visitor bought us that camera, made it a little bit better. We've grown in our ability to do live stream services and things like that. And then we go, to a, we go to a parking lot service. Oh, and that was a lot of fun, wasn't it? You get to sit in your, your vehicle. And I'm out there the first Sunday preaching and there's a high wind. And again, nobody can understand what I'm saying. And things are blowing over. And so Harold McCray builds that box out there in the back to shelter me. And that was really a, a tremendous thing to help me. Don't touch each other. Don't get out of your vehicle. We have a net with a big long pole so we can collect your offerings. Remember that? That was fun too. I, I'm saying, and then we had our own outbreak and then we go to online for a while. I, I'll share this with you. I forgot, I, I was gonna mention it to the first service. There's a church down south and some relatives attend that church. They're very strict. It's, it's a much bigger church than we have been, but you know, it was a very strict church. And so they had a period where they had to go just strictly online. And so this is what the pastor required of every member of that church, no exceptions. You get up in the morning. Now, in this church, every man wears a suit and a tie. That's what you do. And every woman is in a dress. That's what you do. And then he required them to do a selfie with the family. And they had to send in the picture every Sunday morning revealing that they were in their suits and ties and their dresses in their living room. When I heard that, I thought, that is absolutely way over the top. That is, that is not right. And then over the time, it's thought, I thought, you know, while I would never have done that, and I didn't, obviously, I certainly understand the logic behind it. You say, why? Because of what some of you and I think even my family did at time. It's real easy to be sitting there, have the service on, and then go get a bowl of Rice Krispies and sit there with your phone and start looking at your messages. I mean, sometimes in the past we've had problems with people doing that in the middle of a church service, much less doing it at home. It's real easy to get up and, uh, you know, start fidgeting with things at the table, working on a craft or something like that. Why I'm listening to the service, and folks, you know this, and I know this, when those things start happening, you're not focusing on the Word of God. And so that pastor said, no, sir, we're not doing this. You're going to get serious about it because this is God's day. Now, I would never have done that, and I'm not even advocating it. I'm just telling you what that pastor did. And so what has happened since then it's kind of hard to get back in the groove. I'm not going to lie to you. You know, we would have the parking lot service. Then everybody goes home, and we're not allowed to go anywhere, and no restaurants open. Really can't go to many stores except Walmart. Who wants to go to Walmart? Anyway, you know, so you go over to your house, and it was kind of nice because there's Chris and Ray, and there's Katie and Austin, and, you know, hey, I don't normally get to do this on a Sunday because I... I I'm a minister. I, I work on Sundays. I, I do what the Bible says about the priests. I profane God's day. That's what God says about the priests. They profane the Sabbath day, and that's what preachers do. We work. So I didn't have to work. I got to sit at home and grow, enjoy my grandkids and my children and my children-in-law, just spend time together. And then about 545, I'd come over here. I could have blue jeans on or shorts. And, and just put on a, a, a tie and a coat. You would never know. I'm standing behind the pulpit. Oh, look, he's all dressed up for church tonight. There's nobody there. There's Chris. He flips a switch. I come on and I preach. At about 7 o'clock, he flips the switch off. I walk across the yard, and I'm in my house enjoying the rest of the evening. And so when we decided to bring everybody back together at what we now call the Bible study hour, in my mind, I'm struggling a little bit saying, I, I don't know if I want to do this because I kind of enjoy not coming back, even though I just live right there. It's kind of nice just to sit around home. It's like, this isn't your day. 
It's never been your day. It will never be your day. It's my day. Okay. So we'll have Bible study hour five. I wasn't allowed to go to hospitals. I wasn't allowed to go to prisons. The I couldn't even come to your, your family's funeral. So what do you do? Study here at the office. Get ready to preach Wednesday night. Get ready to preach Sunday morning. Get ready to preach Sunday night. And there's not a whole lot else I can do. Write a lot of notes. I wrote a lot of notes, letters, phone calls to people in the church. But I can't go visit anybody because people don't come. Here. Can't go out soul winning because we're told you you're not supposed to get around people because you may give them a virus. You know that'd be great. You go to tell them about Jesus and you kill them. Man, you give them some bug, virus. And so, you know. It's kind of nice not having to get out on Thursday evening and go visiting. Now I just sit home. So I'm telling you, your pastor has struggled with those things. I'm not a crazy man, and I hear it from pastors all over. It's not the same. It is not the same. It is not the same. So my intent, and unashamedly so, is to help you as well as myself get my mind wrapped around what the church is, the importance of it to the Lord Jesus Christ, and we are his image bearers. We're his image bearers. And people in this community do watch to see how full the parking lot is. And they do watch to see who's in this building. And they do watch to see whether you stay home or whether you get up and walk out with a Bible. You know, I'm fine if you use this. I got a bunch of messages I need. Excuse me. I, no, I'm not going to do that. I don't care if you use that for your screen, but you know what makes an impression? Is when you walk out the door of your house, they see this in your hand. They see you walk through the parking lot, you have this in your hand. So even if you don't open this when you come, I'd encourage you to carry it just so people understand. I'm a Bible believer. This book dictates my life. And by the way, this book does dictate my life. We need to cherish the church as Jesus Christ cherishes the church. And that's going to be our focus these next few Sundays. All right, let's bow our heads for prayer. Our heads bowed, our eyes closed. And it's like, Pastor, you're, you're speaking to the choir. We're here. I know that. But I know the struggle I've had. I know the struggle I've had. And so I figure there's probably some people here that have struggled in this too. And there'll be some other things that'll help us gain some understanding. But I just, I want to make sure that all of us right here really cherish the church. This is not a perfect church. I just let you know, when I talk to people, when I spoke to Michael Alunis last week, I said, I want you to know, we are not a perfect church. And this church doesn't have a perfect pastor. We have problems. We're flesh and blood. I've learned over the years never to look for a perfect church or a perfect pastor, just somebody that loves Jesus and wants to please him. Let's cherish the church like Jesus cherishes the church. Father, I pray you take what we've heard and use it for good. Use it for your glory. Lord, maybe, maybe there was no need to address this in the sense with people who are here today. But I know people will get on the website and they'll listen to this message later. There are some who are watching this morning or might get on Facebook and watch this service later. It might be a total stranger from another state who just happens to turn it on and you use it in their life. So God uses as you see fit, Lord, for us, for me especially, help me, Lord, uh, never to lose the passion of cherishing your church. God will thank you for it, we pray in Jesus' name. I want you to stand together with our heads bowed and our eyes closed. Maybe it's just a matter of coming this morning saying, God, I just, just commit to you that I'm going to cherish the church like you cherish the church. 
and you want to come this morning, you're welcome to come. You're welcome to let the Holy Spirit deal with you at this altar. As I've said many times, nothing magic about the altar. Sometimes it helps us to solidify a decision. Maybe you can deal with that right where you stand. But how is your view of the church? Do you cherish the church? It means cherishing each other. And you know what? When, I, when I'm not here, I can't minister to people. When I go on a vacation or if I'm sick, I can't minister to people. So when I have op every opportunity to be here, I need to be here so that God can use me when the opportunity comes to minister to the church. But it's not just the pastor that ministers. It's you. It's you. We together minister to each other. Father, I just thank you for the opportunity to be able to preach your word. I thank you for this local assembly. Thank you, Lord, that you place in the hearts of the Whitehair family and the Posey family to, to have a, a local independent Baptist church in this area. And that praise you and thank you for directing, uh, Pastor Nye's and his family here and this church staying true to you for these 42 plus years. Thank you for that. Lord, this, in a sense, it's now in our hands to be the visible of the invisible God, to show people who Jesus Christ really is. So God, work in us, help us to be everything we need to be as a church family. And Lord, give us a heart of cherishing the church as you cherish the church. And we'll thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Look forward to seeing you back at five o'clock tonight.